Welcome, uh, audience and guests, partners of SnowTrack to the SnowTrack Perspective Series. Today we have uh, five South Snohomish County mayors to provide their perspectives on current transportation issues, and it should be a really great conversation. I'm excited about it. So, um, my <laughs> computer is being a little slow, so just. Try this again. So today we have with us Mayor Frizzell, Mayor Horseclaw, Mayor Marine, Mayor Matsumoto Wright, and soon we expect Mayor Thompson of Bothell to be here as well. So it uh, should be a really great conversation. Uh, for those of you who are new to Snow Track, um, a little bit of background. Uh, Snowtrack advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation. We focus especially on the needs of uh, particular priority populations, uh, people of low income, people with disabilities, older adults, and youth, as well as uh, several closely aligned uh, groups of individuals um, who uh, we make sure that they uh, are getting the transportation services they need across the county. We are excited to have this perspective series as it present as it's an opportunity for the public to hear uh, what elected officials and other thought leaders have uh, about our current transportation issues and try to advance solutions for them. Um, so to, I'm gonna just jump in right away. Uh, so welcome uh, to our, our currently our four mayors here. Um, and let me spotlight Mayor Marine. And we're all here for the recording. And I'm gonna stop the share. Oh. All right, so first question, just a quick introduction. Uh, if we could have you share your name, the city you represent, how long <laughs> you've served. I know some of you have served twice um, in, different, uh, in different times. Um, and then the top three ways you get around. We know that you probably don't get around just one way, probably at least walk from your car to wherever you're going. Um, and finally, if you do serve on a local county or regional transportation policy committee, please let us know which one or ones that you participate on. And we'll start with Mayor Frizzell. So oh, Mayor Frizzell, I am honored to be the mayor of Linwood, Washington. I also serve on the Sound Transit Board and I serve on Community Transit. And I get around mostly by my own vehicle. Uh, it's amazing what the amount of time I put in as mayor. I just don't put that many miles on my car. Uh, most of it is uh, from my home to the office, but uh, I also enjoy walking a lot. And uh, when I get a chance, uh, I kayak. It's usually not to get around though. It's more for- yeah pure entertainment. Well, that's definitely one of my favorite ways to get around, uh, for sure. Um, let's go to Mayor Horseclaw. Hi, I'm Brian Horseclaw, the mayor of Mill Creek. I've been on the council for 10 years now. I've been mayor for the last three. I put about 20,000 miles on my car every year. I put about 5,000 miles between three bikes every year. And I do a lot of walking with my two dogs. And no, I do not serve on any uh, other transportation committee or body. Great. Um, mayor Marie. Yeah, thank you. I am the mayor of the city of Muggleteo. I'm in my 10th year or third term as mayor, uh, not consecutively, but uh, also serve on the community transit board currently um, as immediate past president and also uh, in the past had served on the sound transit board as well. Um, other than that, getting around mostly uh, car, getting from one place to another and um, I think as most mayors, we love having our main office in the city. So that means most of our commutes are very short, uh, which is helpful. And uh, other than that, um, walking would be another way that I get around. All right. All right. Mayor Masumoto Wright. Hi. <clears throat> so um, I'm the mayor of Mont Lake Terrace, and I've 
been mayor for five years and 10 years before that on the council. And um, let's see, um, the, the main way that I get around is by car. Um, the second way is by light rail. And the third way is by bus. And uh, I'm on the uh, I'm an alternate on the community transit uh, board. Great. Thank you so much. Mayor Thompson, if you could introduce Thanks. yourself, yeah, and uh, how long you've served, um, how you, three ways you get around, and if you serve on any transportation boards. Yeah, I um well, my name's Mayor Mason. I'm the mayor of Bothell. Um, I'm just finishing up my first term on city council, and we are council managers, so also my first two-year term as mayor is finishing up at the end of this year. Um, I get around through a combination of different methods. Um, I've got an, uh, an old Sprinter van I've been converting into a camper, so I drive that around, and I also ride an e-bike fairly often. Um, I've got a cargo e-bike that I can go grocery shopping in, um, and one that's just a little bit more fun to ride for kind of when I don't have to throw a kid in the back of it. And my kids are six and eight, so they're they're getting kind of big to throw back there. So I'm really hopeful that we can build some protected infrastructure so they can ride around with me and I don't have to worry about them dying. Um, and uh, I serve, um, I'm an alternate on the community transit board as well. Um, and I serve on the PSRC executive board where we do some transportation stuff. Um, I'm on the 405-167 executive advisory group for WashDOT um, as well, um, because we are partially in King County also. Great. Thank you so much for those quick introductions of yourself. Um, we have a series of kind of policy questions, and then we're going to reserve the last bit of time for the audience uh, general Q&A if they have questions. I expect we probably will get through all of the scripted questions, uh, just to flag that. Um, but so we can get as through as many as we can. I'm going to limit the number of responses to just three people per question. Um, and so self-select which questions you want to, you want to respond to. Um, first, of the policy questions. Um, in Snohomish County, we've seen a substantial increase in pedestrian fatalities over the last couple of years. Uh, especially dangerous has been our major urban arterials like SR99 and Evergreen Way, and certainly uh, Bothell uh, has its own urban arterials that are dangerous. What are your cities doing to address traffic violence? And if nobody picks up, then I'm going to have to call on somebody. Somebody oh, I know I'm, is doing something. I thought you were, yeah. I was waiting for you to call, but I'll, I'll certainly start. Yeah. Um, as I came back in those last two years as mayor again, I've just noticed there's a substantial number of people running stop signs. I mean, just basically blowing through them. We've had a lot of concerns uh, with our community with speeding. And and then, of course, the noise, which is another whole other issue, right? It seems like people with the modified exhaust. What, what I've done is I put in uh, more patrol officers and specifically we've uh, got, a, which I'm very proud of, a, a black on black Tesla, which is just hard to tell that it's a police car. Uh, and it's amazing what you can find uh, when you're not driving around in a black and white. So really more emphasis on traffic and making a difference. We're also will be coming to council within the next month or two with um, traffic cameras specifically for speeding uh, around our school and park zones. Thank you, Mayor Marine. I'll pop in there because everyone knows that Linwood has red light cameras and they have done a tremendous job in slowing people down in school zones and also from uh, speeding through intersections where there's already a red light couple other things that we've done is we've reduced left turns onto Highway 99 in a couple of areas just recently. And uh, we had a, a, a significant event a couple of years ago where a teenager was killed. Uh, he was not crossing in an intersection, but he was crossing Highway 99 around seven o'clock at night in November, very dark and stormy night. And uh, uh, what we ended up doing for his family was putting up a sign uh, memorializing him, but the sign uh, directs people to use the crosswalks. Uh, so it wasn't a sign uh, necessarily because of his death, but what can we learn? What can we take away? And just put an emphasis on using the crosswalks. So many people 
you know, 20 feet from the crosswalk and they choose to cross Highway 99. Uh, I, I don't get it. But those are some of the things we've been doing. Mayor Thompson, uh, you next had your hand up, but I know Bothell is doing a lot of uh, innovative work on this front, so excited to hear what I figured I should probably raise my hand for this one. Um, yeah. We have done a few different things. We are working in our comp plan update right now um, and in the transportation element to eliminate level of service as the primary consideration. Um, we are focusing mostly on how to move people around as efficiently as possible from three different points of view. The first is just moving people through space. Um, you know, what we think of as transportation. Um, the second one is we want something that is financially efficient. You know, in Bothell, we have enough city-owned roads to stretch to Spokane. Uh, of the levy funds we get from the city, uh, about a third of them are for a special levy that most of the money goes toward uh, just simply repairing roads, and it's not enough. So as we look at, like, how are we going to right-size our financial issues, which I know a lot of local jurisdictions have over the long term, I'm keenly interested in those root cause structural elements that will actually make it so we can leave better decisions to our kids. Um I also, um, we finished a bike plan with, I think, 35 miles of protected bike lanes and protected by the definition means if there's somebody in a car and I'm riding there with my kids and they are texting and pull over that the protection will stop the car before it gets to my family. Um, and, and finally, I'll just say that I think we need to understand that design elements contribute to driver speed far more than individual behavior. You know, as policymakers, we design systems. And I think if we are looking at individual behavior and enforcement as the primary method that we're making things safe, we're really ignoring the part of the system that we have control over. Um, I don't want to blame my constituents because we designed a road that it's super comfortable to drive 50 miles an hour on and we expect pedestrians to be there as well. Um, so we, um, um, we've we also redoing our impact fee structure in our comp plan update so we can use those on safety and multimodal projects as well. Um, and actually the last thing I'll say on the um, design elements versus enforcement aspect is that's kind of part of the plan to be more financially resilient. You know, it's pretty expensive to try to enforce your way to safety. So if you can design a road that's safe and doesn't require enforcement, um, that helps us be more financially resilient as well as safe. Thank you so much, Mayor Thompson. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna make an exception here for a fourth answer. Uh, Mayor Holtzclaw. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just be brief. Like the others, speed is a big thing we hear about from our constituents. We've had in my time in Mill Creek fatalities on 527 Seattle Hill Road, 35th and Village Green Drive. So that's enforcement is a big issue, but I just wanted to thank Mason for bringing up the um, bike safety. As an avid cyclist who's been hit twice by cars, that's a big issue. And you know, one thing we're doing to be addressed or addressing is uh, missing links where there's gaps between where bike lanes end and then they have to fight through traffic to get to where the bike lane continues, particularly on 164. Yep, yep. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, okay, we're going to shift to sound transit generally. I have a, a few questions around sound transit. We know uh, the agency is building a regional transit system that will connect Everett to Tacoma with the spine of light rail by 2041, as well as light rail to Redmond, Issaquah, West Seattle, and Ballard, uh, and bus rapid transit uh, from Renton to Linwood through Bellevue and Bothell. Um, so first question is what opportunities will light rail and bus rapid transit provide to your communities? And what are uh, are your cities doing to capitalize on them? Um, you know, whether it's transit-oriented development or trying to encourage people to walk and bike to the stations, what, what else are you trying to do to take advantage of those new stations? Uh, Brian. Yeah, when, as you guys know, we have the green line on 527 running north-south, and the orange line is under construction running east-west, which will get out to the light rail that will be built when I will no longer be on the council. Um, but we are working on a sub-area plan as part of our comp plan update for the area south of Mill Creek Town Center going down to uh, the commercial area just on the south side of 164th. And my hope is that I can convince three of my colleagues, if not all of them, to uh, do something creative and create find some kind of place that could be created there to take advantage of putting some new residents in our community right close to transit so they don't have to be reliant upon cars and will have easy access out to the light rail. That's great. 
I believe we have Mayor Matsumoto Wright next. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, Linwood and, and Mount Lake Terrace will be getting our um, light rail stations next year. So, um, we're going to be the Snohomish County guinea pigs. And we, we've been doing a lot, lot for the last so many years trying to get ready for light rail. And what we're finding out is that. Um, especially in Mount Lake Terrace, because we're, we're not that well known a city. Linwood is more known, Shoreline is more known. That the developers are are not looking at Mount Lake Terrace as as fiercely as they are looking at the, the city to the north and to the south of us. So we're really working at, in trying to get um, more density being built near the, the station. And a little later, we'll talk about uh, one of your questions. Uh, we'll we'll talk about how to get people to the stations. Um, but there's a lot of things that we're doing, a lot of things that we want to do, but it all takes money, grant money, whatever, whatever money we can get. I'll, I'll finish for now. Okay, Mayor Thompson. Yeah, I'm actually um, keenly interested in transit oriented development and just helping people connect and also using that as an opportunity to help us be more financially resilient again. You know, we can't talk about transportation without talking about housing because the biggest predictor of vehicle miles traveled is how far away you live from everywhere else you need to go. And historically, what we've done as a strategy is we have essentially forced people to live a long way away and really provided driving is the only convenient way to get around. And now we're like, how are we stuck with this traffic problem? It is a mystery to me. Um, when realistically, this is just a result of the decisions we've made. And if we want better results and less traffic, we have to do different things, not just keep trying to do the same thing a little bit harder. Um, you know, I... Um, Oh, and also we had Urban3, a firm that does um, financial analysis, come out and do a model of Bothell. So as we densify around our transit lines, we are also raising our tax revenues faster than we raise expenses because that highway costs the same amount to, to maintain regardless of how many people live behind it. And, you know, as we look at trying to figure out how to eventually, you know, maintain and replace all of our roads while keeping tax rates as low as possible, you know, bringing in more, you know, more hands on deck to help pay the bills, uh, I think is a really important uh, real traffic solution, but also um, a, a way that we can be fiscally responsible with times and try to leave our kids a better context for their budgets they're going to write when they're on council in 20 years. Um, you know, we have this, I, I think the top thing that we make decisions around in local government is the idea that absolutely nobody likes other people's cars. My car is the only righteous car. Super bad news for the rest of you, your cars are traffic. Um, and the problem is, is we sort of believe this thing where if we just built more space for other people to put their cars, that my car, the only righteous car could continue unencumbered. And that's just not the way it works. When we build more infrastructure for something and give it away for free, whatever it is, more people use it. So really our strategy, because we don't like other people's cars, has incentivized far more other people's cars to drive in. Um, I could say a lot more, but. I'm going to stop there. Okay. Thanks, Mayor Thompson. Um, we have a couple more questions on Sound Transit. Uh, so I know there's a lot happening in Linwood, particularly thinking about the new transit stations there. Um, so maybe you can touch on opportunities that, uh, as well. But um, next question is, you know, it does, uh, the new stations do present some challenges for our communities as well as we're, uh, as our cities grow. Uh, whether it's displacement um, or other, or just managing your budget or other issues. What are some of those challenges and how are you as a city trying to address them? So I can start off on that. Um, many of you who have traveled through Linwood in the last three years have seen 196 in an evolution process uh, that was specifically geared towards transportation. It was geared towards buses being able to get people to where they want to be. And a lot of that has to do with, with uh, the transit center. So two and a half years later, it looks absolutely beautiful. And uh, we're, we're just moving forward now, moving over to 200th and making some similar changes uh, over there, widening roads, trying to get people where they want to be. 
You know, it used to be that if you lived in a city, 90% of your time was spent within that city. Uh, you had your your uh, favorite restaurants and and entertainment. Your schools were there. Uh, your family was there. And as our society has grown, grandma and grandpa don't live near us anymore. Maybe they're down in Tacoma and we want to send our kids to school over at, at UW Bothell. And we've got other friends over in West Seattle. So the idea that, that we can do everything that we want to do uh, and, and still remain uh, off of the roads is, I think, for most of us, pretty unrealistic. And what Sound Transit does, in, and also community transit, is it makes it easier for people to get to where they want to be. And it doesn't matter to me uh, you know, how people get there. We need to provide opportunities. And and when we're redeveloping our downtown core here in the next few years, we're really looking at uh, mobility modal options for mobility, uh, biking and walking and, and uh, you know, as well as cars. But the overarching idea is getting people to where they want to be. And in this day and age, a lot of people just want to be somewhere else. And, and I think that's what um, we're looking at quite a bit. Uh, a wonderful option that came onto our radar uh, a little over a year ago through community transit was the zip car. And we have a two and a half mile radius or so where we operate vehicles to get people to those shorter routes. A lot of the problem is people want to drive to the transit center, and maybe that's only a mile to the transit center from their home, and then they want to get on the buses or or the trains. And what the zip cars do is it provides an Uber-like experience for the same cost as a bus ride, and it gets them that extra mile. And that uh, zip program was so successful that sound transit board members just at our last meeting unanimously voted to continue that at a cost of a little over a million dollars a year but we're meeting that need we're getting cars off of the road we're getting them away from parking in our parking garage which is only going to house uh, just under 1700 vehicles but if your car sits there for eight hours it takes up space for someone else so uh, a lot of a lot of of good things going on there, and now the Zipcar program is going to be pulled out in Darrington, Arlington, and Lake Stevens, and I'm eager to see how they're going to do with it. Mayor Matsumoto, right? And I just want to piggyback on that. Uh, first of all, it was community transit that we voted on. Uh, to did I say the wrong one? You said sound transit. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry about that. <laughs> but um, I, I want, uh, so Linwood is getting a light rail station. Mount Lake Terrace is getting a light rail station. And um, and the numbers may be a little bit different now, but um, in the past, I heard that 60% of the people who park at the park and rides live within a mile. So, Wow. That, that's one of the, the parking problems that people have. Um, and so if we can get them out of their cars and, and to, the, um, to the light rail station or the transit station to a bus um, without bringing their cars along, um, that is gonna save a lot of um, headaches for everybody. And the, and the zip car is one of the, the best ideas that I've ever heard about getting people to do that. And it's such a success. I know it's an expensive thing to do, but it's such a success that I want it for the whole city of Mount Lake Terrace too, because we, we are getting a light rail station. And also, um, uh, well, Mount Lake Terrace, and um, I'm sure that Edmonds wants it and, and everybody's gonna want it sooner or later, but we just have to figure out a way to get people out of their cars and use public transportation and how to get but the problem is how to get from your house to that public transportation and I think 
Mason probably has a lot more to say about that too. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Mayor Thompson, and then we'll have Mayor Marine go on this question too, and then we'll go to the next question after this. Perfect. And I'll try to be quick. Um, I think the biggest challenge we face is that we've spent a century going in a certain direction around land use and transportation and change is really tough because we have created a system where driving a car is really the only convenient way to get around for most of what we need to do. So 95% of us see ourselves primarily as drivers and we see transit bike ped infrastructure as infrastructure for somebody else. And, and it's pretty hard to you know, go to your constituents if they think that you're working for somebody else more than them. Um, you know, the happiest drivers in the world are in the Netherlands, per a study by Waze a few years ago. Um, and the Dutch have tons of options to get around and lots of things they can walk and ride to. And that creates a system that works better for everyone, including people who drive cars. Because when everybody feels like driving is the only convenient option, a, a system is created that we've seen the results of because it doesn't work great for anyone, including drivers. Because you've got so many people in cars that it's traffic's really bad. It's not safe to walk a bike, so people don't do it. And transit headways are pretty long. Um, so that's not always a convenient way to get around either. So we've kind of got this system that's not working well for anybody. But the problem is, is that everybody sees themselves as a particular subset of that system. So changing and actually a root cause solution that would make it better for everybody is politically challenging at times. Um, you know, in terms of uh, people getting to sound transit that um, Mayor Frizzell brought up, I, I believe it was, um, I think I think the number is 80% of sound transit riders access the system from something other than a car parked. And I think connectivity for walkers and rollers to safely get to those stations is super important, not just to support transit access, but to reduce traffic, to open up parking spaces for people who live farther away, uh, really just provide those safe options. You know, somebody shouldn't feel like they're going to die on a walk to the bus stop or a ride to the bus stop. And, you know, if, if people want to use a car as an umbrella, they can, that's fine. But as policymakers, we need to do everything we can to make sure that we're trying to get the results we want, which is more people using transit and fewer people um, parking in the spots that we want to park in and driving on the roads that everybody else wants to drive on. Mayor Marie. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I'm very excited about having the link light rail. I've always thought that having a kind of that commuter spine uh, and allowing that and, and then have community transit be what it should be, moving people in the community to those places they need to go and not be running buses up and down the freeway for commuter. Um, I'm rethinking this um, kind of micro transit or the zip cars they're talking about. I was just at the APTA conference and there's actually a group that is Uber Transit. And I'd like, and I'll bring back to community transit to have one of these programs in one of the cities, it certainly could be Muckleteal, but to look at seeing why don't we use Uber um, and have the person pay 350 or whatever they would normally pay for a bus to take that route and then community transit would be subsidizing the rest of it. I think that may not only be more efficient, but a cheaper alternative in the long run than building a whole new system that's already basically out there. Um, but anyway, just an idea that had come up and uh, may want us to try because we want to be efficient. We want to solve the problem we're trying to solve uh, with the least amount of tax dollars. Well, that uh, that's kind of the perfect segue. So uh, potentially you may want to expand on the next question here, Mayor. Um, so, you know, outside of Sound Transit, um, most of the transit service in Snohomish County is bus service, uh, Everett Transit, Community Transit. And then we do have some nonprofit transportation providers providing essentially public transportation services, Homage Senior Services, um, as well as Lincoln Hill Retirement Community. Uh, North Shore Senior Center also provides kind of a paratransit service within uh, Bothell. Um, so as you think of all of those services, what are your hopes and dreams for our county's bus systems uh, and what they can be in the future? And, you know, so what's kind of your vision in the year 2050 and what do you think can be done in the near term? And maybe, Mayor Marine, since you were already kind of expanding on that, maybe you could expand a little bit more of your, your vision and then we can go to a couple other mayors. Yeah, I think, um... Our transit agencies are doing a good job of trying to address those needs and how we're, you know, with micro transit is a good idea. We're looking at, and I will talk about this a little bit more as well, but um, electrifying or using um, 
hydrogen fuel cell and deciding which one is a better option or is it a combination of the two? Uh, but really, it's, it's you know, our motto, how do we get people from where they are to where they need to be in the most efficient way, something that's convenient for people. Most people don't want to take two hours uh, by transit if they can get there in an hour by by uh, car, right? You need to make it work for everybody. And I think they're doing a good job of of constantly working that and, and checking it and making it more user friendly. I mean, it's so much easier now uh, with the apps and stuff to be able to find out exactly what's the best route to get from A to B. Uh, and um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just getting better all the time. So I, I hold out a lot of hope for our future that we can we can make it even even better as long as we're continuing to uh, to tweak it. And and I apologize because I'm going to have to fly off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you, you so guys much for being a, able to join us. Great today. Yep. Um, anyone else? Yeah, Mayor Thompson. I, I waited to see if anybody else was going to raise their hand because I feel like I've answered every question and I don't want to monopolize time tonight. Um, but in terms of like hopes and dreams for bus service, I think the most important thing that we need to do for buses is dedicated right of way. You know, buses move a lot more people through space than cars do. But they also have to stop to pick people up. And when you drive a car, you don't have to stop to pick people up, but you have to sit in traffic created by all of the people driving cars. So buses, when they don't have a dedicated right of way, are, are get a lot less efficient because they have to sit in all the traffic that is created by the cars, and then they have to stop on top of that. You know, in my perfect world, um, in the future, buses have dedicated right of ways so that they can essentially be an option to opt out of traffic whenever you would like. If you want to go somewhere and it's 5:30 and uh, traffic's terrible to get anywhere, the bus can just zoom by all of that. So um, I, I'd say that's that's my hope and dream is that we can look at transit not just as something that we need in order to move people around, but really it's only the people that have trouble affording to drive a vehicle because I think the average cost is up to like 12000 a year. Um, I want it to be a system that people take because it's more convenient, because it gets you there faster, because it's less frustrating when you don't have to sit in traffic. And this is totally doable. We see this all over the world. Just as policymakers, we need to decide that it's important for us to give people better ways to get around. Um, and I think the needle's moving a little bit on that in terms of just political will. Um, but yeah, dedicated right of way and enhanced service and headways, um, that's how we're going to going to make a bus system that's going to be more convenient to get around and people will take even when they have the financial means for other options. Okay. Uh, Mayor Holtz-Clock. Yeah, my hope and dream is to see more bodies on the buses, um, but I want to echo Mayor Marine's comment. Uh, back in the 90s when I was living in the Fremont and Ballard areas of Seattle and working downtown, I was a bus commuter, also a bike commuter, but by bus, it was very convenient. If it's not convenient, people won't ride it. And so for our community, especially with the Orange Line coming, you know, we don't have the grid neighborhoods like you have in Seattle. And most of our cities in Snohomish County have these funky, weird road systems. We have to make sure that we have the feeder networks in place to get the people to the rapid transit so that it is convenient uh, for them to utilize. Otherwise, those buses are going to remain or are not going to get filled up like we hope they will. I want to combine the next couple of questions because I think it, uh, there's the ability to kind of feed off of where we're going here. Um, the region has, uh, through Vision 2050, it's a regional plan, has uh, prioritized the growth, the population growth, 65% of it to go near high capacity transit, walking distance, a quarter mile if it's bus rapid transit, a half mile if it's a uh, light rail station. 75% of the um, employment growth to happen there. And it, it, in addition, you know, our metro, or sorry, our regional growth centers can also be that home of that space. So Bothell, you have Canyon Park, Linwood, you have Linwood City Center, Everett has Metro Everett, um, all of places where we want to grow. And there's certainly kind of opportunity costs that we have as we think about it. There's both uh, financial opportunity costs, but also spatial opportunity costs. Um, we have a new uh, we have new park and rides being built across the the Sound Transit light rail system. They cost about one hundred and 
twenty-five $150,000 per parking spot. Uh, so there's a financial aspect, but there's also the physical space of those buildings that take up that could be affordable housing, could be jobs, could be employment. I'm not saying any of that is right or wrong for what we've made decisions, decisions in the past, but those opportunity costs exist and we have to make them as we go forward. We do have comprehensive plan updates that are happening and you are thinking about your um, your regional growth centers in Linwood and Bothell and how you retrofit them to deal with those roadways that are not so grid-like, not like Ballard. Um, and so you get making them a finer grain, make them a little bit more residential. So what are you thinking about as you go into updating your comprehensive plans? Um, what are you excited about to updating your comprehensive plans uh, to making sure that that growth, that 65% of the uh, residential growth happens near our transit systems? Like I said earlier, I'm excited about the possibility of getting a sub area plan put in place to take advantage of the bus rapid transit that exists and is going in. We're kind of in a prime location, you know, as is Mayor Frizzell with Linwood. Um, you know, we've, we're positioned to do something. I hope our council will act. Mayor Frizzell. So I have a document in my office that was written in 1993. And for some of us, that doesn't seem like that long ago. And for others, it seems like almost a lifetime ago. But in that document, our uh, city planners went out to our community and it was an extensive month long process about how do we want Linwood to grow? And I will tell you that we have stayed fairly true to that plan and we have put a lot of our multifamily housing out towards the mall and preserved our single family neighborhoods. So, and out towards the mall is, is you know, on the way of the transit line. And so we are very fortunate in that we've had some very forward looking people in our city for a number of years. And we are taking advantage of transit oriented development um, in partnership with Sound Transit and opening that up to nonprofit organizations or low profit organizations so that we can open up uh, appropriate housing for folks that we anticipate will be on light rail. We're also looking at uh, workforce housing uh, around the college, workforce housing around the convention center. Uh, we have a building going up right now where Buca de Beppo used to be, if you're familiar with Linwood, and they have apartment units that are only four to 800 square feet and uh, really trying to work with people that are looking for just a place to rest their head at night, most nights, and be able to hop on to Sound Transit with a five minute walk. So we've really been uh, developing for that for the last 30 years. And, and it, it's more than, than just happenstance. It's really been a planning process for a number of decades. Mayor Matsumoto, right? Thank you. Um, pl planning for for light rail and planning for density and planning for TOD, transit-oriented development, is really hard. And we've been working on it for a long, long time. Um, and we, we've had to um, educate our, our citizens and, uh, and, and a lot of things. But the, the main thing is um, we, we rezoned everything up to 12 stories, up to eight stories, up to six stories. We don't have those lots sold yet. They're, uh, they're, and I have a feeling that they're going to, some of them, some of them are, are getting developed, but, but many of them, I, I have a feeling that uh, the developers will just all of a sudden find out about Mount Lake Terrace after light rail arrives, which is amazing because they should be buying up those properties right now. And so we're working really, really hard with the development community and with our citizens. Um, and we are, we're trying to get as many, as much density as we can right next to the light rail station and within a quarter mile, half a mile. Um, but boy, those planning sessions are really, really hard and we're putting it into our comprehensive plan right now. We're really trying. 
Thank you. Um, so I think all of our cities have goals around creating safer streets. Um, and uh, we're at different states within the cities here represented in terms of where our plans are at. Um, I know like the Connect Linwood plan is a really robust plan of uh, bikeway infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure trails and ADA improvements that need to be made that maps out basically everything that needs to be done. Um, Bothell just updated or created a bike master plan and is enrolling that into the transportation element. Um, Malik Terrace uh, have a review of ADA infrastructure and a great complete streets approach towards the downtown area. Um, but the, the rest of the city is still trying to be planned out in terms of what the infrastructure is gonna look like. Um, you know, so some of you have uh, ideas of, you know, your existing financial resources to be able to complete those plans uh, to build out all of the sidewalk infrastructure you need, the bikeway infrastructure, the ADA infrastructure. I'm curious, kind of, do you have enough resources? And if you don't, where do you think the money needs to come from in order to, to build out uh, a truly safe infrastructure for people of all abilities, no matter how they get around? Well, without a doubt, it's partnerships. It's partnerships with WashDOT. It's partnerships with uh, our our folks in Washington, D.C. Uh, the city of Linwood is about 40,000 people, and that's 5% of all of Snohomish County. But we generate more than 20% of the sales tax. There's a lot of people coming to our city that don't live here, and we benefit from you know a higher sales tax but our county really reaps in the benefit as well of our higher sales tax. And so we've been able to work with Snohomish County um, on some projects. So it, it takes a village. It takes taking advantage of the grants that are available. Uh, we will be embarking on a project of the popular way overpass to get people from the mall area to the freeway uh, via an overpass. But that uh, took groups of, of city staff going back to DC, working with a lobbyist uh, over a decade. And we just saw the fruition of that a year ago by being a recipient of $25 million for that project that we're expecting to be about 49 million. It takes time, takes a lot of planning and it takes persistence. You, we didn't take the first five no's and throw up our hands, we just stuck with it. Takes partnering. Yeah. Mayor Thompson. Ah, I'm already unmuted. Um, in terms of financial resources, no, we don't. Um, you know, again, in Bothell, we've got enough uh, lane miles, just city owned roads, not counting the highways to stretch to Spokane. And that costs a lot of money to maintain, to say nothing of when we are eventually going to have to replace those roads because they don't last forever. Um, I'm really interested in putting Bothell on a path toward financial sustainability on its own um, without relying on federal and state grants, which we're, we're still going to need because you guys, cities don't fund their own transportation projects. Like we, we go out for federal and state grants um, and we do our best to try to piece things together. Um, but I'll tell you, it's a lot easier to get more money for a project that adds lane mile capacity than it is for a project that is just multimodal. Um, and we're starting to see winds of change there with the most recent uh, transportation package that passed um, a lot of the federal stuff. We're seeing more money for more efficient ways to get people around from a financial point of view. Um, and, um, and yeah, you know, like I said, as we update our comp plan, I think housing and transportation are the two biggest things that we can do as a city to help have a long-term solution for our financial problems. Because when we let more people live behind a road, it costs the same amount to maintain the road. Um, but now we have a few more families adding to our tax base and paying taxes. And I'm keenly interested in reducing the upward pressure on property taxes that so many of our communities are seeing. And if we want to do that, really what we have to do is we have to figure out ways to spend less with time. And when you look at where the vast majority of our capital budgets go, it's roads. Um, and, and maintaining them is a huge chunk of our operating budget as well. And all of this for a system that is one of the top things that I hear complaints about 
when I go talk to people in Bothell. They say, hey, traffic's terrible. It takes me 20 minutes just to get to the freeway or there's never any parking downtown. Like a lion's share of the complaints that I get from residents about everything in the city have to do with how we get around right now and they don't like it. So I feel like number one, we need to change things just because we can't afford to do what we're doing right now. And we are all on a crash course with financial insolvency. Um, and number two, like our people don't like this. Like they give us feedback that this isn't working for them. Um, and I'm interested in a root cause structural solutions to those big problems we face. So I'm trying to change up the way we do things a little bit because I want better results for our community. Nice. Uh, let's shift towards our last question, which I'll modify slightly. Um, climate change. Um, more than four, more than fifty percent of our emissions in Snohomish County comes from the transportation sector. Uh, so part of the solution is transportation sector. Uh, it feels like a lot of people believe that if we were just all electric, that we would solve our climate change problems. Um, What's your views and what are you doing to either uh, accelerate EV adoption or to find solutions elsewhere uh, within your transportation sector? And I know we've talked about that a little bit, but maybe make a point of it on the climate change uh, side. I guess I'll just jump in. Yeah. Well, um, obviously, if we continue to do what we're doing, um, climate change will happen even faster. Um, I've always been wondering about solar, solar power, solar energy, even in the Northwest. Because I went to a, a, a convention a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, and, and they talked about the fact that solar power works even in a place like Seattle. And, and I'm talking about cars. Um, and there, there's probably a reason why solar energy cars are not available today. And that has probably has a lot to do with the gas industry or the auto industry. Um, but um, let's look at something that's free because hydropowers and all the other wind power, all of that uh, takes a lot of money to produce. Um, and, and so does solar. But uh, it's something that if you had it on your car, on your, um, you know, on your uh, the top of your car, wouldn't that be something? Uh, and it would uh, it would be cleaner energy and so forth. But that's just my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, Mayor, what's going on? Um, this is more of a personal answer. I like EVs. My wife just bought one, but I don't think it's it's a part of the answer. I don't think it is the answer, especially until we get a network of charging stations up. And I fear that by the time we get that up, we're going to have other alternative forms of engines. You know, I've seen a lot with lately about ammonia engines, about hydrogen-powered engines. Um, so it's part of the answer. I don't think it's the magic bullet, though. And especially when you look at, I saw an interesting article that sales are slumping in the last few months of EVs and the inventories are stockpiling because I think they're reaching the saturation for the households that are willing to have one EV and people like my wife and I are kind of nervous about getting that going all EV and having two and not having that long range and the, the charging network in place yet. Um, I mean, what we need to do if we think climate change is real, and I do, is we have to reduce traffic. And that has the added benefit of reducing traffic because who likes traffic? Um, there's two ways to do that. Either people need to take um, fewer trips in their vehicle or they need to drive fewer miles for the trips they do take. And the best way that we can make that happen is for people to live in greater proximity to all of the places that they need to go and other people. Um, we don't have to ban cars. We don't have to get rid of cars, but we can move the needle in the right direction for a lot of our problems, including climate change, traffic, and financial sustainability by letting people live in greater proximity to each other and having more transportation options. You know, and in terms of, you know, the EV so, uh, conversation, um, we have to decarbonize vehicles. Um, like they have to be a part of the solution, but they can't be the only solution because electric vehicles have a lot more embodied carbon than a gas powered vehicle. Um, and they also produce a whole lot more tire dust, um, which is a significant um, cause of microplastics in our waterways. It's killing our coho salmon and EVs because their batteries are a lot heavier and they just have a lot more uh, tires that grind into the ground. 
So the overall pollution for EVs is less, but it's not an enormous amount less. Um, also right now, the um, amount of pollution globally that is going because of building new roads and creating new concrete is um, is actually higher than tailpipe emissions. So it's not just the tailpipe emissions, it's also the infrastructure that we need to drive on. The fact that, you know, in Bothell, we've paved about 18 and a half percent of the entire city to drive on between roads and parking lots and driveways, compared to about 11% for buildings and about four or 5% for parks. Um, the um in, in terms of climate we have to give people more efficient ways to get around and the really good news is it helps address a ton of our other big pro problems too like financial sustainability um you know housing costs really what we need the most isn't to know what the solution is it's just political will to do the things that can actually meaningfully address these enormous problems that we face and transportation is a huge driver of all of those things that's great well, we're at the end of our set questions. We have a couple of questions in the chat that I want to get to at least one of them and then open it up to the to see if somebody wants to come on screen. I think this question is from, I don't know how to pronounce her name, Balin, Balin. Uh, um, but the initial question goes back to one of our first, um, which is, uh, when you're addressing unsafe driver behavior, how are you doing it in a way without relying on police enforcement that has disproportionately impacted Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, and so that is a, a concern that's come up over and over again around police enforcement, since the, especially since uh, George Floyd uh, in the summer of 2020. Anybody want to take this on? I'll, I'll take that on just... Okay. Um to say that red light cameras are do not look at skin color they look at license plates and uh, they protect our our most vulnerable in school zones and i think that that's vastly important love them or hate them um, i know i drive uh, better because i i know that the red light cameras are there uh, but they don't discriminate Yeah, Mayor Thompson, I know you're uh, exploring a potential expansion, but you also made a comment about some of the concerns with them. So, Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I'm keenly interested in root cause solutions. Like, how can we fix something for good? And how can we fix the thing that's actually causing the problem, as opposed to put a Band-Aid on it with enforcement? And enforcement, look, it's going to be necessary. We have to deal with the reality of the now um, as we look toward creating a better future. But that reality can't keep us from trying to make a better future. Um, I'm also keenly interested in addressing multiple problems at once. And some of the issues have been been brought up with enforcement. Another issue is it's just really expensive. You know, uh, police uh, are the biggest uh, part of our uh, general fund budget. Um, they do a really good job, but they've got a whole lot on their plate because we've defunded just about everything else. Um, so the police have to do a lot of things that they're not good at, they don't want to do, and they're not really trained to do. Like, you know, ask cops if they want to be put on the traffic beat. Like, you're not going to get a whole lot of hands in the air for that. So if we can look at root cause solutions like road design, so people don't feel safe driving fast, so they drive slow. If they don't feel safe, like they're actually going to be a lot safer because it will change their behavior. Um, and um, also just from that financial point of view, it's incredibly expensive to treat something that you could treat with road design with an ongoing expense. Okay. Well, let me open it up to see if there's questions from the audience. Uh, if you are an audience member and would like to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand. You can also put it in the chat. Um, I'll just note, uh, sorry if I mispronounce your name, Belen, Belen, uh, that you made a couple notes in the chat regarding um, how you're engaging BIPOC communities within the conference and plan updates and just general engagement, I, I assume, within all of the city processes which is good. And then a recommendation about using a racial equity toolkit or something similar when implementing uh, uh, camera enforcement programs. Um, and I guess I would recommend also looking at some of the work that the city of Seattle has done in terms of uh, how to implement it. Um, Snow Track also could have some recommendations if anybody has uh, interest in that. Uh, any other questions from the audience here? 
I see that there's pointing at something. Um, uh, Senator Lovick's office, Braden. Oh, sorry, you have a physical hand up. All right, very good. Hey, sorry about that. I couldn't find the uh, raise yeah. hand function. Everyone, my name is Braden Siegel. I'm Senator Lovick's legislative assistant. Uh, really have enjoyed listening to you all. And the senator apologizes that he couldn't be here himself. He's on a building codes meeting at the exact same time. But I'm going to you know, debrief him on kind of what I've heard from all of you. And I was just kind of curious to hear from each of you if you have perspectives. Like I know going back to buses, the real focus is to get more bodies on the buses. And I was curious from each of your perspectives, what do you think would be one of the most meaningful investments, if it's in infrastructure, if it's in the quantity in your bus fleet, but like, what do you think would be the most meaningful investment in your city to increase ridership? I think someone in the chat, I think it was Amanda Dodd mentioned it, the frequency of the, those feeder networks. If they're, if you have to wait 45 minutes for a feeder to get down to the bus rapid transit, people aren't going to use it. Good. Mayor Thompson, I think this will be our last comment of the, of the day, and then we're going to wrap up. Yeah, I mean, uh, what I would recommend for Senator Lovick is that we need the ledge to help fund bus service. Like the reason people don't take the bus is because I think it might have been Mayor Marine that like it takes twice as long to get somewhere. And and that's quite simply because we just don't prioritize it. Like the fact that the bus takes longer to get places than vehicles is a policy choice that we have made and we continue to to make. And if we want better results than what we've seen from our transportation system, we have to make different decisions. Um, you know, I would love to see shorter headways, um, you know, more reliable, regular bus service. And again, if we are funding exp uh, highway expansion or really any lane expansion, we need to seriously look at painting those lanes red and having that right of way be specifically for buses so that they don't have to have all of the inherent disadvantages of having to stop at stops and the disadvantage of the other mode of transportation we primarily use, which is the fact that cars take up a ton of space and traffic sucks. So I would just say prioritize bus service um, as well as making sure that if we are adding lane capacity, that it's a dedicated right of way and you start to make it a much more attractive option because it's a lot cheaper, um, not just for the people to use, but also for us to maintain. Um, and uh, also we can make it more convenient if we make the policy choice to do so. Thank you, uh, everyone, for um, participating today. Thank you to our mayors for participating. It was a really great conversation of different perspectives and different ideas. Um, and I think it's really illuminating for the direction of our communities. Um, this has been the third uh, panel discussion of four that we're holding. Our next panel discussion is with the North and East County mayors next Friday, 12 to 1. Hope to see many of you there again. Um, again, thank you all for being here and especially to our mayors for participating. Uh, hope to see you all again soon.